we've understood the difference of the Holy Spirit, we receive that salvation as compared to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've discussed these things. We've seen different instances in Scripture of how the Holy Spirit's outpouring took place there in the early church. And we understand that the gifts of the Spirit must be founded upon the fruit of the Spirit, right, in order to be effective. And so a couple weeks ago when I last spoke, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And it is imperative for the believer to walk in the fruit of the Spirit first, okay, first. Uh, that, that is so absolutely critical to our, our walk, our walk with Christ. So today we're going to be focusing exclusively on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So if you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, say amen. amen. All right, that's good enough. Verse 4. Verse 4 says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them and all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Everybody say common good. good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of those tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. Let's pray. Father, I thank You, Lord, for the opportunity to share Your Word. I pray again, God, for myself that I need a clear mind, Lord Jesus, so that my, my speech would be clear. God, I pray again You take my stutter and my stammer, Lord Jesus, to be able to speak clearly and concisely to Your people today. God, that You would show us Your Word. Show us these things in Your Scriptures. God, teach us Your ways. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. The title of this message this morning is The Charisma Tone. I might say ton, but it's uh, in the Greek, it's O, a long O, the Charisma Tone. Okay? So we're going to be talking a little bit about the Charisma Tones as we walk through this process this morning in this series, Who is the Holy Spirit? So, two main ideas I have for you today is first is going to deal with this what is the purpose? of the gifts of the Spirit. What is the purpose of these gifts? And as we begin to break this down, we see here in the beginning and opening passages that there are two main branches. There are two main branches of these uh, spiritual blessings that take place in the believer's journey, in the believer's walk, okay? The first one we deal with is the spiritual gifts we're going to talk about at length today. So in chapter 12, verse 4, it says that we have spiritual gifts, and the word gift there in verse 4 in the Greek is charismatone. With the long O, charismatone. That's where we get our word charisma today. And a lot of times we start getting a little bit um, uh, messed up with words, our verbiage, and sometimes it gets into semantics. When we think of a charismatic person, we think of somebody who is excitable, who is uh, a good speaker, a good leader, somebody that kind of bounces around a little bit and gets people excited. But friends, that's not necessarily what the word charismatone means. The word charismatone means they are gifted, okay? It means that they are um, anointed of God. It means that they have a gift. It doesn't mean that your personality gets boisterous. It doesn't necessarily mean that your personality becomes uh, bouncing around, okay? The Holy Spirit will work within your personality, okay? Now, some of you say, I'm pretty much introverted. I'm a quiet person, you're quiet perhaps most of the time, but I've seen some of you quiet people cheer for your kids at ball games. okay? And so don't tell me that you're just a quiet person because it's all about the environment that you're in, right? If you're cheering for your kids, that quiet personality all of a sudden went out the door. Some of you guys are Broncos fans, and I've seen a very quiet individual all of a sudden come to a Bronco game, and they are very boisterous. So don't give me that load, okay, that says, well, I'm a very quiet person. Friends, we all get a little bit... Uh, Um, boisterous given the right environment, all right? So we will become that, okay? So don't think that in order for me to be a charismatic person that I have to be boisterous at church because that's not true because the Holy Spirit will work within your personality, okay? One of our great leaders here in the Assemblies of God is our former district superintendent, Don Steiger. I mean, if anybody was very quiet and reserved, it was Don Steiger. And some of you know him. I mean, he, I mean, if you ever saw him get excited, it was, he unbuttoned the top button of his shirt was the length of excitement that he got. Uh, he never raised his voice. He never shouted. I mean, he is as plain vanilla as it gets, but he's one of our great Pentecostal leaders here in this district. And so 
Again, the Holy Spirit will work within your personality. He's not going to turn you into something that you are not, okay? God already created you a certain way, okay, when you were, when you were born. When you were born that, that way, you are born with that personality, God made you that way, okay? There's not necessarily a reason for him to, to, to cross all these wires and change you into um, a different type of personality, of that type of a person, okay? So the two different branches of spiritual gifts, we talked about uh, the charisma tone, Okay, and that's where we get the word charismatics. Doesn't necessarily mean that you are a a person that's excitable and bombastic and bouncing around. What it means in Scripture to be a charismatic or Pentecostal is that you believe in the gifts of the Spirit. There are a lot of churches out there that don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They don't believe in the baptism of the Spirit. They believe that it, that it died out with the early church, that when the apostle John, the last apostle, the last disciple, that when he died, they believe that the gifts died with him. Okay, Those are what we call cessationists. We don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit ceased. Okay, We believe that they are still for the church today. They may not work to the extent that the early church had, but we do believe they still work in the church today. All right? Sometimes it's always environmental. We hear many times the, these miracles go on in missionaries' lives or in Africa. We hear all these things going on in China about miracles and a lot of these different things going on. Because a lot of times I believe when the church is under persecution, we see those gifts at greater extent, greater length. When the church is under persecution, you're going to see more and more miracles taking place. What caused the early church to explode with power and favor? It was that persecution. They were spread all over the Middle East, all over, all over Europe, okay? So sometimes we are going to pray as Americans, God, we want to see more miracles. We want to see more gifts. Uh, we want to see what happened in the early church here. And I think all of us could say that, but friends, we've got to be careful. Be careful what you pray for because that's going to mean the persecution needs to come. In my opinion, that's what needs to happen in order for that to take place. I want to see miracles but it may be at the cost of persecution, okay? So continue to wrap your mind around that just a little bit. So the two branches of spiritual blessing, we talked about the charisma tone, but there's also other branches. We see this in, in chapter 12, verse 5 and 6. It continues to unfold that to us, that there are spiritual service and working. Spiritual service and workings that are in the local church. And friends, these can be intertwined with the gifts of the Spirit, with the charisma tone. So the service and working can be blended with the charisma tone gifts. They can also work separately. They are separate things. They can work independently of each other, but they can also be intertwined. Friends, the spiritual service and works can be charismatically flavored. Okay, they can be flavored that way, but they're not listed. These works and service are not listed as being charisma tone in nature. Okay, they're a blessing to the church. Most of us operate in works and service of the church, but that does not necessarily mean that they are charisma tone, okay, the, the gifts of the Spirit. They are gifts to the church for the growth of the church, but they're not gifts of the Spirit. Okay, we are spiritual people. The Holy Spirit is, is in our lives. If you, are, if you are a saved believer, you have the Holy Spirit resident within you at salvation. Okay, you are a, a believer, Okay, so you can continue to walk forward in the fruit of the Spirit. But the gifts of the Spirit are only unlocked through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when we look again at the, the second branch of spiritual service and working, okay, we see there in chapter 12, verse 28, some verses that we didn't read. I'll read them now. It says, in, And in the church God has appointed, first of all, apostles, prophets, teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others. Okay, so you see this? You see some of the charisma tone mixed with helps. Okay, capiche? They're mixed together. They can be working together, all right? So having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. And then the rhetorical question that Paul asks is, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts? eagerly desire the greater gifts, so that tells us there are gifts that are better than others. And Paul here listed both the works and service blended with the charisma tone power gifts. He says they can work hand in hand. My NIV that I like to read out of, it says gifts of administration, but the word gift there, if you have an ink pen, you go ahead and cross that word out because that is not in the original Greek. That is something that the translators added in order to aid in our understanding. So the administration, work and service of administration is not a charisma tone. It's not a gift, okay? But it is a blessing to the church and allows the church to grow, okay? So administration 
is, is a gift to the church, but it's not the charismatone gift. So again, that word in the Greek does not exist. It's not there. So you can cross that one out in order to aid you in understanding. So we have that in chapter 12, verse 28, that fivefold ministry of service and working. Again, mingled with the spiritual gifts. Now, the spiritual gifts with spiritual service. Chapter, <clears throat> why is this given? I told you earlier, we told you to repeat a certain phrase. What was that phrase? Common good. What is the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit? It's given for the common good. It says that in chapter 12, verse 7. Friends, we need to understand that if the gifts of the Spirit are damaging, if they're hurtful, if they're embarrassing, if they're angry or vile, then it is not of the charismatone. It is not of God. Okay? Let me say that again. If it's damaging, hurtful, embarrassing, angry, or vile, then it is not of the gifts of the Spirit. It is not of the charismatone. So let's see how we disseminate. How did Paul disseminate the gifts of the Spirit? How is the charismatone brought, uh, broken down? Well, Paul lists that there are nine charismatone branch gifts, nine gifts of the Spirit. And you understand that five of them deal with verbal power. The majority of the gifts of the Spirit deal with verbal power, deal with the tongue. Okay? So let's look at these verbal power ones. First one is message of wisdom. Message of wisdom. That's godly wisdom that is profound beyond others' present understanding. A lot of times this is found when you're looking for a decision. When, uh, when the board meets together, they're in the boardroom. Sometimes we're praying about a difficult decision or we'd be, we'd be asking the Lord for a certain direction. That would be an opportunity for a message of wisdom to be given. Okay? Have you ever been in a, in a group setting or in a, in a format and you have an aha moment? Okay, maybe it's in a, in a Sunday school class, um, somebody's praying about a certain problem, and somebody gives a, a word, and it just is one of those things that sounds so wise, it sounds so powerful, that everybody's just kind of like, wow, it's profound, it's deep. That might, might be a message of wisdom. Now, sometimes we have those moments out there in the secular world, but this is one that takes place in the church, not inside a necessarily a building, but inside the church people. Okay, it's a message of wisdom for God's people. Okay, a message of wisdom. If, there is a, if there's a problem in your life and uh, you're looking for insight, you're looking for godly wisdom, that would be a message of wisdom. It's one of those things that when you hear it, you sit back and say, wow, that was of God. Okay, that's the message of wisdom. The second one would be a message of knowledge. There's this godly insight into another's life, into another's present or future circumstances that was not known by the giver. If you have somebody come up to you and they give you a, a word of knowledge, a message of knowledge that's insight into your life that they could not have known, that seems like they just read your mail, as it were, people that know what they said to you was exactly in line with what, we, what you're dealing with right now in your life. Just spoke right into that. One of those instances, I believe, would be when Jesus was there uh, at, the, at the, the well, and that woman at the well experience took place. She comes up there, and he asked her for a glass of water, and she says like that, he says, I'll give you spiritual water, I'll give you living water, and she says, how are you going to get this? And then he speaks a word of, uh, of knowledge into her life, okay? He says, go back and get your husband. She says, well, you know, I'm not so sure about that. She says, yeah, in fact, you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Okay, that's a word of knowledge. Now, Jesus being fully God and fully man, Jesus being fully God, he already knew that, but that would be an example of Jesus reading your mail. Okay, that would be an example uh, of God knowing exactly right where you're at, knowing your circumstances, knowing your situation. Jesus did not know that woman. He met her then at the very first time. Okay? And he was, as being fully God, he already worked and works in that gifting already, Right? And so that would be an example of that. He read her mail. He just told her exactly. He said, you've been married five times, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. That was proof of his messiahship to her. She freaks out. She runs back into town, gets all the neighbors and friends, and brings them back to the well, and they have a little bit of a church service there at the well, right? Because it didn't do anything. That word of knowledge, it didn't do anything but confirm to her who Jesus was, his authority and his messiahship. So that's, it might be a case of a word of, or message of knowledge. Another one that might be there in Scripture that it kind of goes maybe in a word of the prophetic versus the word of knowledge would be Paul and Agabus. 
Remember, Paul is heading back to, to Jerusalem for the first time, and he's almost to Jerusalem, and he camps out overnight there in the community of Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima, beautiful oceanside property, and Paul ends up spending a couple years there. Didn't know it at the time, but he was about to spend two years in prison there, Caesarea Maritima. But before he goes to Jerusalem and gets arrested, Agabus, this guy comes up to him, takes off Paul's belt, and then Agabus ties his own hands with it and says, the owner of this belt will also, this is going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. Okay, it was prophetic in the, in the fact that it was about to happen in the future, but it was very concise, okay? There's a lot of people that say they like to try to operate in the prophetic, and that it's just so ambiguous in such a gray area that there's no details offered. But Agabus comes in and gives you details and said, you are going to be bound if you go to Jerusalem. He says, well, I'm heading to Jerusalem tomorrow. And so that would be considered maybe a word of knowledge, perhaps maybe a word of the prophetic, okay, a word of prophecy. And I, now I want to uh, talk a little about prophecy because the, the word of prophecy can get misconstrued quite a bit. When we look in the original Greek and when we look at the scripture and we continue to walk through the Bible, when it talks about the word of prophecy, nine times out of ten, that is the proclamation of the word of God. 90% of the time, it's the proclamation of the word of God. Okay? In other words, it's somebody using scripture, proclaiming God's word to the church. Nine times out of ten. So most of the time, it is forth telling telling forth the scripture. We would say that this is an anointed word. Okay, that's where the anointing would operate, there in that prophetic word. So all of scripture is God-breathed, therefore all of scripture is anointed of God. Okay, so when we teach and preach out of scripture, that is in a sense, and again in the Greek and the New Testament, that is the rendering of the prophetic, prophesying. It's forth telling. Now what most of us think of when we think of prophecy is foretelling. Or, um, yeah, foretelling, in other words, you're foretelling the future, okay? A lot of us might fudge it a little bit on semantics again, but we say we enjoy studying Bible prophecy. Well, all of the Bible is the Word of God, therefore all the Bible is prophecy, as we declare it being uttered by God to His people who wrote the Scriptures, okay? What most of us mean by we love studying Bible prophecy is that we love studying end-time events, end-time prophecy, okay, because all the Word of God is prophecy. Only a few books of the Bible deal with end times prophecy, and that's what people oftentimes will talk about. The book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the uh, book of Joel, others like that are end times prophetic in nature. So that's usually what they mean, but all of God's Word is prophetic, in other words, a foretelling of God's Word. Okay, this is where, we, again, we see the anointing. The next verbal gift that we see here in Scripture in the New Testament is the speaking in tongues. This is not your prayer language. A lot of people receive a prayer language, okay, when they, when they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is not that. Your prayer language is your private prayer language you pray to God with. You don't understand what you're saying, okay, but the Spirit, your Spirit, is praying with the Holy Spirit. Okay? The speaking in tongues that is listed here is a gift to the church. Okay? It's not for you, it's for the church. It's for uh, a group of people in your church. It is for the believers. Even Paul says that if an unbeliever comes in and you're all speaking in tongues, he's going to say you're all out of your mind, you're all nuts. Okay? This is a, a message in tongues is for somebody in the church that is a believer okay? to be able to receive that, okay? to understand that. They don't, they don't have that understanding. The person giving the tongue doesn't know what they're saying. The people in the congregation don't know what they're saying. Therefore, it must work in conjunction with interpretation, which is the next verbal gift. It has, have, has to be interpreted. Paul says, I would have you rather speak in English. Offer, you know, I'd rather have you give five intelligible words in English than 10,000 words in a tongue. So when we're looking at the gifts of the Spirit, Paul concisely says that the gift of tongues is the weakest gift. He says, I would, have, I would rather you uh, deal with the stronger gifts. And the only one he listed as a stronger gift is the gift of prophecy. Okay? And so there are different gifts. Now, there are different denominations that like to um, camp out at one certain gift. They like that one gift, and they want to camp out. There's, there's groups that are ultra-faith. They love the faith gift. They really want to maximize that gift. Um, there are other denominations that camp out in healing. They really want to focus on healing. Um, then there's other denominations that want to camp out in speaking in tongues. 
Friends, the Bible says very clearly that all of these are to be disseminated to the entire body locally in a church. We are not to camp out in just one gift. Friends, we need to be willing to operate in all of the gifts of the Spirit, not just one, okay? And so to be a denomination or to be a fellowship or a people group that focuses on one gift makes us um, weak, okay? It makes us weak. We cannot do that. We've, we've got to um, continue to focus on all of the gifts of the Spirit. So we talk about the nine different gifts of the charismatone. We've dealt with the five verbal ones. Then there's two for spiritual enhancement, faith and distinguishing of the spirits, having the gift of faith. Now, the Bible says all of us have a measure of faith, but the gift of faith may be used in a one-time moment, in a one-time event. You know, I've, I've had the opportunity to said we kind of come up against a, a brick wall and didn't know which direction to go, and it's kind of like, well, and then I've I seen a gentleman offer a word of faith, and the whole climate of that room changed. Boom. The gift of faith was uttered. All of our hopes were lifted. All of us decided we were going one direction, and then the gift, the word of faith was given, and all of a sudden we went that direction of the impossible. I've seen the gift of faith used in a church where we were going in the thoughts and likes of man, where it didn't make sense, it was not possible, and all of a sudden the gift of faith, the word of faith was uttered, and all of a sudden we decided to go ahead and let's do it. It's impossible, but let's just see what God is going to do. Okay, that's where the gift of faith lives at. The gift of faith lives in the impossible. And sometimes God uses that person in the gift of faith to give one utterance of that faith and all of a sudden, everybody in that room senses that in their spirit. That is a gift or a word of faith, okay? Then there's the distinguishing of the spirits. That's not to be used outside the church. It can be. But friends, again, this is for inside the church. Because you know, as well as I do, that everybody that goes to church doesn't necessarily uh, all got all the Happy Meal fries, right? There are a few people that are a few fries short of a Happy Meal. That's what I was trying to say. There are some people that come into the church who attempt to undermine it. There are some people coming to the church who may not have bad intentions, but their spirit is not right, okay? They're not walking in the fruit of the spirit. They're not walking in love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, self-control, and those gifts that are listed there in Galatians. They're not walking in those, but they're trying to operate in a charismatone gift, and it's not the right spirit. That's sometimes when we sense somebody that wants to give a word uh, of the prophetic, they want to give a word in tongues or give an interpretation, and it comes out wrong. Okay, it comes out bitter, it comes out angry. That's not of God. And it takes somebody willing to say, that was not correct, I'm sorry, and just gently, gently kind of let them down. You know, there's no sense, we don't have to condemn anybody, but that was not said in the right spirit. There's a distinguishing of spirits. And that's not usually a pulpit type of a gift necessarily used on a sermon message. But a lot of times as a pastor, it's before and after. Before service or after service. Somebody will try to come up and there'll they'll be a distraction, okay? Trying to distract away from the word, uh, be a point of discouragement before I preach. Uh, before I preach the word, they try to discourage me. Afterwards, there's sometimes um, uh, people who try to catch my eye um, and it's wrong in nature. As men of God and as women of God, we've got to protect ourselves with purity. So sometimes our wives or our husbands have that discerning gift. Sometimes the women, it's a, it's a sixth sense. And they tell me, that woman, you stay away from that woman. Okay? That may not be a sixth sense. That may be a, a distinguishing of the spirits. That, may, that woman may be a godly woman. She may be in the church, but she doesn't have the right spirit. And she may be trying to take down a pastor. She may be trying to take down somebody in the church. There are people in the church who don't have that covering. They're maybe kind of simple-minded, and they will be lured in by these type of spirits. You know, in the old days, we used to call them a Jezebel spirit, okay? Um, and so we've got to be careful with that distinguishing of the spirits. We've got to guard our hearts. We have got to guard the church. We've got to guard the ministry. And part of that is the distinguishing of the spirits, which helps to protect the local body, okay? <clears throat> And then the last two of the gifts are two spiritual powers. Powers. We've got the verbal gifts. Uh, we dealt with uh, just a moment ago the, the enhancement gifts. Now we're dealing with the power gifts, healing and miracles. 
those are self-explanatory. Healing and miracles. People operate in those gifts. There are some people that God uses for whatever reason. Some people in healing and miracles more often than anybody else. Now, to my knowledge, there's not too many people operate in that gift. But they're, they are out there. Okay, for whatever reason, God will use them. Sometimes God will use them only one time in their life to do a miracle of healing. All right? So when we look at all of these nine gifts, therefore, again, most of the charismatone gifts are verbal, which means that most of the charismatone gifts we experience will also be verbal in nature. That makes sense. But very few, less than a third, less than a third of the gifts will be miracles and healings. If we understand it comparatively. If we compare nine... You have the five and then the two. It just sounds like good reasoning that there will be less gifts of healing, less gifts of miracles, just because of the sheer number of gifts that are presented to us. If we assume God distributes proportionately, which when we assume what God does is always a dangerous thing. When we assume what God is supposed to do, how he's supposed to do it, that's a gray area. That's, that's, we ought not to walk too much into gray waters. Okay? Some of you guys went camp on the 4th of July. If you have an RV, you've got three you know, different tanks on your RV, right? You've got a fresh water, you've got a black water, you've got gray water, okay? Let's not walk in the gray water too much. If it's not in Scripture, let's stay in the fresh water, okay? Nobody likes walking around in gray water, and we're certainly not going to walk around in black water, okay? So make sure we stay out of the gray water. Let's not assume what God should do and how we should do it. But it stands to reason that two power gifts versus five verbal gifts, okay? It sounds like we should have more verbal giftings than miracle giftings. But when we as believers, when we walk forward into embracing the gifts of the Spirit for the modern day church, we have to understand that if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, that you have a gift. If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have a gift of the Spirit. Now, how are you going to operate in it? A lot of us just like to, to camp out on it and just and put it to the side. We don't, we're not encouraged by a pastor, perhaps, to operate in that. We're not encouraged by a leader. We're not encouraged by a wife or a husband to, to work in that gifting. And sometimes these are a little bit scary. It's scary for me. I'm not scared of the Holy Spirit working in the church. I'm scary of people who lack self-control trying to work in the local church. The Holy Spirit does not scare me. His workings in the church does not scare me. It's people of flesh that try to abuse the gifts of the Holy Spirit that scare me, okay? Make that delineation there in your mind, okay? Uh, chapter 12, verse 8 through 9, we, we, we spoke about this. You have a gift of the Spirit. The Bible says, verses 8 and 8, 9, it says, to one is given this, to another is given this, to another is given this. God distributes these gifts of the Spirit liberally throughout the church, but it is the person's responsibility to use that gift. God is not going to force you to use his gift. God gives you the keys to a brand new pickup truck. He's not going to force you to drive it. If you choose to park it in your garage and close the garage door and never go back in the garage, then that's up to you. That's your choice. That's your decision. But if God has given you a gift, he encourages you to take that truck out and drive it from time to time. He wants you to use that gift, not just camp out on it there. That's my new word for the week, camp out. It's got done camping out. <clears throat> okay. God doesn't want you just to, 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 to park that nice truck in the garage and never bring it out. Friends, nobody will operate in all of the gifts all of the time. There's not a Superman out there. Okay? We like Superman. We like all these superheroes. I mean, what, is the, what has America been feasting on with our entertainment the last five years? Superman, this, just one superhero after another. We've been eating superheroes for lunch for forever, it seems like. It's like that's all that Hollywood puts out these days, a superhero, because we like that kind of stuff. We like the idea of what it would be like to have these extra powers. But the Bible says here that the believers were not going to operate in all the gifts all the time. You're not going to be a superhuman believer, okay? You, you're going to operate in one or two gifts at a time. Probably about it. Okay, the Holy Spirit is going to disseminate to the church one to these different individuals. Now, in the case of healing and miracles, sometimes we're going to work in faith. Faith, the gift of faith, the gift of miracles may come together. So on rare occasions, those, those, those gifts may operate hand in hand. Friends, we may operate in one gift only one time in our life. 
Another gift we may operate in frequently. When I was growing up there, at, uh, we had family camp there in the late 90s, and Dad could tell this story. I want to butcher it, I know, but there was, there was this, uh, this young couple that came in towards the end of family camp. It was like the second to last night or the last night, and it was a rough family. You know, they just had a rough life. You know, they, they, they looked rough. You know people that look rough. They had a baby girl that was only about two months old, and she was dying. We're taking her to the hospital. I don't know all the case, but the doctors had declared her to be terminally ill. They told this rough young couple to take her home because she's going to die and make her comfortable and enjoy your last few hours or your last day or two with her, and she's going to pass. They didn't know anything about God. They didn't know anything about church. They, talk, they, they heard about this, uh, this camp meeting going on up there at Camp Cedar Ridge, and they said, you know, basically kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, what's it going to hurt? It's in the middle of the week. It's the only church thing we know going on. And it's amazing when people will turn to God when you're at the bottom of the barrel. People will turn to God. And they found out God was in the house there at Camp Cedar Ridge that night. It was like a Thursday night or Friday night. And so they walked in not knowing what to expect. And they brought in this little two-month-old baby girl. And somebody uh, found out about it, and they whispered to my dad. My dad was a district superintendent at the time. We had this powerful altar service going on at the end of the service that night. And um, dad just has a word of faith. He said, bring the little girl to me. And dad tells the story of what's going on to the whole congregation. And they right then there, he just has kind of this moment of faith. I don't know if it was a word of faith or a gift of healing. Sometimes you can't tell the difference, but God, my dad prays for this little girl to be healed. And a moment, when dad finished praying, the little girl's eyes fluttered open. All of a sudden, she starts making these, these suckling, suckling movements with her mouth, and she wants to eat. And so dad's like, well, I don't know. here, mom, you, she's hungry, now go feed her. And so that girl lived through the night. She lived through the next day. And in the course of the weeks, we continue to find that she's still living. She's still living. And she continued to live after she was a year old. And now through time, we've lost track of who she is or where she was at. But that night, God worked a miracle through that gift of healing. Maybe it was the word of faith also partnering together to, to heal that little baby girl of a, of a family that was without hope, a family that didn't know anything about God. All they knew was that they were going to give God a shot when they're desperate with their child just like any of us would. And so sometimes, I don't know if dad goes around healing people now. I don't think he goes around healing, but I think God used dad, at least in that one instance, with the gift of healing, with that word of faith. So let's pray and believe that this little two-month-old baby girl is going to be healed. God has used dad in other cases, in other situations, but that's one I know of. Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't happen all the time. We would love it if it would. Sometimes the Holy Spirit says, now's the moment. Now's the moment to have faith and believe for a healing. Now's the moment to believe for a miracle. Friends, and we need to, as believers, be willing to be used in those gifts. Secondly, today, I'd like uh, Pastor Tyler, and <clears throat> if you guys could help me set up uh, some sawhorses over here and just put, them, just put them right here on this right side of the stage for me. Yeah, the sides are about equal. It's about an equal number of people on both sides. Okay. Usually I try to put on whatever side's a little bigger than the other one. Second point, I only have two points today, but how are the charismatone gifts to be used in the church today? How are they to be used in the church today? Our culture is a lot different from the culture in the first century church. Okay, sometimes the culture changes things, and sometimes we ought not to allow the culture to change some things. Okay, it's well understood that we don't do church today like we did in the first century. If we did church today like we did in the first century, then now hardly a church would be open in Delta today because it's different. It's different. There are some things that Paul did was based in the Jewish faith because Paul was raised up as a Jew. He was a, a Jew of Jews. He was a great teacher. Okay, The way they worshipped in the synagogue was men worshipped on one side and women worshipped on the other. In the Orthodox Jewish communities today, it's still the same way. Men on one side, women on the other side. Okay, same as in Islam. Men worship in the front, women will worship in the back. Some of that's Middle Eastern culture. We don't have that in our Western culture today, but even though Paul's talking about that, there in the New Testament doesn't necessarily mean we have to follow and ascribe to everything that Paul says. Okay, they have different styles. So, all right. Well, I guess we'll do it on this side. All right. All right, let's go ahead and do this. Thank you, thank you, fellas. You may be seated. Appreciate it. Let me see that drill there. A little hand drill. This is cool. I like that thing. I'll show it to you here in a second. When we look at gifts 
of the Spirit being used in the local church today, we have to first of all recognize the potential for abuse. There is potential for abuse. And some of you have been abused in the church according to these gifts in one way or another. Okay? Sometimes we didn't know what we're doing, and other times we've said, no, we're not going to do that. There is going to be potential for abuse in the local church. And so we have got some, I've got some power tools up here. Thank you guys for bringing that. I've got some, a little jigsaw, I've got myself a little skill saw. Is this power tool capable of abuse? Most certainly. My friend Rick Aragon, he was here earlier this morning. You guys know a lot of his story. I asked him this morning if I could use a little bit of his story. He was out there sawing and, and ripping, and he cut his hand off. And you guys know Rick. He, he walks around with a stub now and a hook. Sometimes he's got this really cool black claw that he brings to church, and it's just a, uh, like a, the Terminator hand. You know, it's kind of crazy. But that was a power tool that did that, right? It was a power tool that took Rick's hand right off. Now, did that make Rick... Um, Hurt, obviously. They nearly, they nearly lost him. He nearly died there on the table as they were trying to rush him to Denver. Um, did it cause him to, to never use power tools again? No. Rick still uses power tools today. He may not use them the same way he used to, but he still uses power tools. He had to make the decision that despite his pain, despite the loss of his hand, he still chose to use the power tool. Now, he's not going to be able to use it as much as he used to, but we adapt, don't we? We adapt to whatever has been dealt us, right? We adapt. We figure it out. Now, <clears throat> Rick can still use a power sprayer, one-handed tool, great. Still uses a screwdriver. Now, if somebody else is in the room that can use the screwdriver, because you can two hands put the screw in there and zip in that drywall, he'll have somebody else do that. But he won't just... Uh, does not do it by himself unless he has to. But he still chooses to use the power tool despite the fact that it caused him great pain in the past. And sometimes we as believers need to understand, you may have been hurt in the past for whatever reason, but you've got to make the decision to continue to move forward and to continue to desire to use the power gifts of the charisma tone in your life. Okay, I know you may have been hurt. But you've got to forego that. You've got to put that in your past. You say, God, I'm going to give that to you. I'm going to allow the blood of Jesus Christ to cover over that pain, whatever it might have been, because I know, God, that you're wanting to use me in these gifts, and therefore I'm laying this down at your feet. We have to choose to do, to, we have to choose to do that sometimes when we've been hurt, when we've been hurt in a church. A lot of times that abuse that occurs is often based in pride and self-serving reasons. The abuse that takes place in the charisma tone gifts is most often based in pride and self-serving reasons. A lot of times we feel very prideful. We feel like if we can give a word, a prophecy, a message of knowledge, uh, a word of wisdom, a tongue or an interpretation of tongue, uh, we feel like that elevates us in the local church. We feel like that makes us uh, higher than anybody else. And sometimes that is a prideful thing. That is a self-serving idea. And that is where we have the distinguishing of the spirits. That, that is not right. That is not in order. Okay? If that person is being used in prideful uh, reasons. Friends, the presence or absence of humility is the greatest indicator of whether or not the charisma tone is being used or abused. If a person is walking and being used in humility, I as a pastor would allow that person to be used in one of the power gifts of the church. If the person is not walking in humility but is arrogant and prideful and thinks more highly of themselves than they ought, then I will, as a pastor, say, no, it's not appropriate. Okay? I look for humility in the heart of those desiring to be used. Friends, this is where the, the discerning of the spirits comes in. It, it's part of that again. One of the gifts that can operate there is the discerning of the spirits. What was it? That, remember we talked about Simon the sorcerer a few weeks ago. He was a believer. He was a water-baptized believer. And what it was it that he wanted? He wanted the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that he also could give it. Sounds like a good idea. But it was prideful and it was self-serving. There was zero humility. And what was it that Peter said to him? He said, you can go to hell and your money can go to hell with you. That's what he said. He wanted to buy it. 
So we have the discerning of the spirits because the gifts of the church can be abused. Abuse is usually based on the verbal gifts. I've never seen anybody abuse the gift of miracles. You ever seen anybody abuse a gift of healing? You can be abused a little bit. When you make a show out of it and you fake it and all this kind of stuff, it can certainly be faked on television. But friends, you can't fake it locally. TV and Hollywood, they can fake all kinds of stuff. But when it's somebody you know gets healed of cancer, you can't fake that. Okay? You can't fake that. So most of the, most of the faking that can be take, taken on, the most of the abuse is going to be in the verbal gifts. What is associated with the tongue? Friends, anything that is based in the tongue of men can be counterfeited. Okay? So when we deal with one of the gifts of the Spirit that is based in the verbal gifts, the gift that is associated with the tongue, you have to consider the source. I am allowing this person to speak into my life. And is this person a man or woman of God? Or is this person an idiot? Does this person live by the fruits of the Spirit? Or is this person full of, of um, whatever else the world is full of? Is this person full of the worldly spirit? You have to determine that. If this, you have to consider the source. Is the source good? The second word, the second confirmation is, does it confirm in your spirit? Most of these words that are given, a message of wisdom and knowledge, um, tongues, interpretation of tongues, they will be used to confirm what God has already been speaking into your life. It's not supposed to be new information. That woman there at the well, okay, when she came up, it, Jesus spoke into her life. It was not new information. He said, yeah, you've been married five times, and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. That was not new information to her. When Agabus came up to the Apostle Paul and took off his belt and, and tied his hands and said, you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. Okay, that had already been told to Paul. Paul had already felt that in his spirit. That was going to happen. That was a confirmation, not new information. Capish? Capish? Thank you. You're here. Friends, people that give these verbal gifts must first operate in Galatians 5.22, the gift that should be the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Again, we dealt with the fruits two weeks ago. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, self-control. Self-control. And that's what Pentecostals are not known for. Huh? We're not known for self-control. I've had people come up to me and say, I I've got to give this message. I've got to give it right now because if I don't do it right now, I'm going to lose it. If I don't, it has to happen right now. That's not self-control. The Bible clearly says in these same chapters that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. In other words, you are in control and you need to be in control. You need to be in control. Why? Because the tongue is deadly. James chapter 3, verse 3 through 10 says this. It's up on the screen. That when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example, although they are so very large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. Sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Oh, pastor, we're not supposed to say the H word. It's too hard today in 2019. James said it. James is the brother of Jesus. I think we can handle it. Verse 7, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. If you doubt that, just look on Facebook. It is a restless evil. Full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. I try not to do that when I'm driving, but sometimes it happens. <laughs> These human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Friends, out of the same mouth come praising and cursing, my brothers and sisters. This should not be. Friends, it's something we have to work on. The fruit of the Spirit. Uh, taming the tongue. We must work on that. Friends, do you understand that people's entire lives have been ruined by what somebody else has said? You don't believe that? Just look on our politics. People will bring up false witnesses time after time after time to falsely accuse people publicly, and they will destroy their life just for politics. Friends, brothers and sisters, this should not be what James said. Friends, therefore, if we operate in the fruit of the Spirit first, the fruit of the Spirit first, then our tongue is tamed by God and therefore the verbal gifts have credibility 
and are endorsed by the fruit of the Spirit. They must be endorsed by the fruit of the Spirit. If somebody is known to be mean, angry, and spiteful, and bitter, but yet they want to speak in tongues and give an interpretation, I'm not going to let them because they are not in control. They're not living by the fruit of the Spirit. Their lifestyle has negated whatever it was they felt they needed to give because the fruit of the Spirit is, what the, found, is the foundation of the gifts of the Spirit, friends. Friends, if someone is verbally abusive to their family, if they're verbally abusive to other people, then why would I as a pastor allow them to speak for God in a church? That doesn't make sense. Well, God told me to say that. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen here today. I'm not going to say it's because you're a nasty person. But that's what I'm thinking. Friends, oftentimes it is about power and it is about control. Pride. We understand these things. Power, friends, is to be under control. Power is to be under control. It says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, and talking about prophecy, prophecy is to be used for these reasons. It is to be used for strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. If a word of prophecy is given and it is demeaning and is hurtful and is spiteful and it is angry, that is not a word of prophecy. It says it's to be used for strengthening, encouragement, and for comfort. Chapter 14, verse 33 says this, For God is not a God of disorder, but of what? Peace. Or order. Many of you just jumped in on that. It's good. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So you need to underline that. If you come to church and you feel icky inside because of a word that is given, that's either one, the Holy Spirit is convicting you of something, or secondly, it's because it was not given in peace. Amen. Chapter 14, verse 40 says this, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Got to be done in a fitting and orderly way. It must be under control. If I were to take this guard back, and just turn that puppy on right there and just start running around with the, uh, with the blade wide open, that's going to cause abuse, that's going to cause damage. How do we put this thing under control? We use basic safety principles, don't we? We put on safety glasses, we might put on some gloves, we let the guard back down, and we let the saw do the work. And we don't, get, we don't get on here and just start jumping around with it, do we? We don't let it jump around. You keep the power under control. Why? Because it's powerful. The gifts of the Spirit are likewise very, very powerful. It's got to be kept under control. And if you are a person that is not subject to self-control, if you're not subject to the control of God, even though you may have the gift, it ought not to be used until you can learn some control. Just because you can turn it on doesn't mean you should all the time. You understand? It must be under control. And if you can't understand that control aspect, understanding the control of what God is wanting to do in the local church, then we've got to set that thing down. We've got to be careful. Got to be careful. So we've understood the, the potential for abuse. We've understood the powers to be under control. And the very last idea I want to leave you there this morning is recognizing the potential for power. Recognize the potential for power. Okay, where's my little, yeah. This is where we are as believers a lot of the times. This might indicate where we are when we first get saved, we first come to Christ. Okay, we operate. We can get the job done with this, can't we? We can get the job done with this. Okay, we've got the fruits of the Spirit. We can get the job done. By golly, we put this thing on there and away we go. Now, the gift of power, I've got a power tool here. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Jim told me. All right, this is a power tool. Now, which one of these tools do you think is going to get the job done faster? This one? Yeah. This is the gift of the Spirit. This is the assembly. Uh, this is assigned by the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? But until we master this one, we ought not to use this one. Okay? So, uh, come on up here. Pastor Tyler, come on up here, too. <clears throat> All right. Come on over here. Stand where I'm standing. Pastor Tyler, you stand over here where I'm standing. You can have this one. We're going to have a race. 
I want you guys to drill a hole through that board. On your marks, get set, go. Do another one there, Landon. There we go. Power gifts. Power tools are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Give them a hand. You say, sit down. That's fantastic. All right. It's a simple idea here, friends. Friends, there is great potential, isn't there? Potential for great power. We've understand the potential for abuse. Okay, abuse is gone. Understand the potential for power. It can accomplish such mighty and powerful things. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says that there is power of life and death is in the tongue. We understand that there's death in the tongue. We see it again on Facebook every week. But there's also power of life. There's potential for life in the gifts of the Spirit. There's potential for life in those verbal gifts of the Spirit. And so therefore, we should live in the life of the Spirit, friends. We understand that power can be intimidating. It is going to be intimidating. Remember when Judah first used that power angle grinder, putting it there in the metal because he didn't know, he didn't understand. You stay away from the sparks. And he let that angle grinder just put sparks right into his thigh. And he's like all over the place, a little scared. It can be intimidating. The first time he used a little power rivet machine. We lined up there and we put the rivets in there and it went pow, pow And it pinched his fingers there where the back of the handle was when it finally let loose. And you know what? He never wanted to use that riveter again. But what did I do? I told him, you need to get back on that riveter and you need to continue to keep using it. Just because it pinched you once, if you don't overcome that fear in your mind right now, you may never go back and use that rivet gun again. You've got to understand that sometimes we're going to get burned in church. We're going to get burned with things of, of the church nature. But we can't allow it just to, to bite us and then we just hands off. We've got to continue to walk it back and say, let's, let's keep trying it again. Why? Because it usually needs a mentor. We need a godly mentor, a godly man, a godly woman in our life that has already walked down this path that can help us out and understand some of these things. Friends, just because the power to us, potential for harm does not mean we lay it down. But friends, we also need to understand that the power of God will change lives, not destroy them. The power of God will change lives, not destroy them. Just as lives have been ruined by people's words, other people's lives have been given life by people's words. And do you understand that a message of wisdom or of knowledge or a prophetic word could radically alter someone's life? It could alter their life. Many students have received a word from God. They're at, at camp or different uh, things that are going on in their lives. Then that student would spend their entire life trying to fulfill that prophetic word. But these words are to be used as confirmation to what that student has already felt in their heart from their own Bible reading time, from their own prayer time, from what they feel the Holy Spirit is already speaking to them. Friends, we have got to understand that we will be held accountable before God for every word that we have spoken on His behalf. I'll say that again. We will be held accountable before God for every word we have spoken on His behalf. So when we operate in the verbal gifts of the Spirit, we had better be hearing from God. Other people's lives is not lives we ought to be practicing on. I don't believe in going around practicing the gifts, okay? That's, to me, that's, that's a concern. That's a little bit dangerous because if you're going to speak for God and you're going to be practicing on somebody else in their life, you're speaking for God, okay? To me, that's, one of the, that's part of that gray water, that gray area of the charismatic Pentecostal movement that we have got to be careful on. We don't go around practicing. Friends, if you have the gift of Almighty God, I believe that God is going to speak to your heart He's going to show you who to say it to, how to say it, when to say it, okay? And it will be confirming to you as well as to them. You could dramatically alter someone's life for the good. You give people hope. You give people peace. You can give people comfort if these gifts are used in a proper and appropriate ways. But it must be under self-control. You better make sure that your walk with God is right before you start operating these power tools.